a monster trade in the NBA yesterday. Dame Lillard goes to Milwaukee. Should the Hornets get involved in the ripple effects? Should they pursue a Drew Holiday? We'll get to that today on Locked On Hornets. You are Locked On Hornets, your daily Charlotte Hornets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Uh, in a minute, cuz we live. We live. <laughs> Locked on Hornets, part of the Locked on Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free. We're available anywhere you get your podcast. And that includes YouTube. There's Doug. He's jamming. You can find him on the Substack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. I'm Walker Mail. You can listen to me on WFNZ 92.7 FM every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m. Boom, Doug. Monster Woj bomb yesterday. Coming in at 215, 220, something like that. I only know the time because we were doing live radio. And what there's were you doing when? Playing. What were you doing when moment? The Damian Lillard trade drop. Not not all that far from that territory, I think. Not all that far. Because I was doing a live radio show, and that is what you do live radio for when the big news drops. And then a pretty easy local angle to cover here, Doug. So let's get to the trade, and then let's get to the Charlotte Hornets on top of that. In the trade yesterday, the Milwaukee Bucks, they traded for Damian Lillard. Sorry, Miami, you don't get him, even though you wah, thought you wah. were getting him all along. Damian Lillard goes to Milwaukee to team up with Giannis. In return, the Blazers get Drew Holiday from Milwaukee, and then they get DeAndre Ayton from Phoenix, who was also involved in this trade. The Blazers also get to Monty Kamara. That was the 2020, uh, this mm. was this past second round pick. 2029 first for the, uh, from the Bucks a Bucks pick swap, and then the Phoenix Suns in return, they get Nurkic, Nas Little, Keon Johnston, Grayson Allen. So that's the trade. Oh, boy. Really for the Charlotte Hornets angle here is Drew Holiday is going to be shopped again. The Blazers are not expected to hold on to Drew Holiday. They are, the report was, at least initially, that they were going to look to trade Drew Holiday to another contending team. We are not a contending team. At least for yet, the NBA yet. Finals. <laughs> At least for the NBA Finals. At least for the NBA yeah, Finals. Yeah, what are we contending for? Yeah, we that. always say contending team. What are we contending for? That's that's a We're good question. We're contending for a playoff spot. Right? Are we contending for Drew Holiday? <laughs> you know, that, that's what I want to know. And whether they should be. You know, because there are a lot of people, when we started talking about this, and they started using that text line, the, the old famous text line on WFNZ. Okay. A lot of Hornets fans wanted Drew Holiday, Doug. I ask you. Should the Hornets be interested in Drew Holiday while including what it would take to get him? Mm, yeah, I mean, that's that's the real rub, right? Because the answer is, should the Hornets be interested in a player uh, that is one of the best defending guards um, in the league and has all kinds of veteran experience that this team desperately needs would be a perfect fit next to LaMelo Ball would be what we've been screaming for this organization to seek out. Yes. The answer to all of those is yes. That's Drew Holiday. Mm -hmm. He is the perfect player uh, to, to set alongside LaMelo Ball. The problem is he's on he's under contract this season, and the next season he's got a player option that he can exercise and go wherever he wants. And he's even made indications that after – maybe maybe accepts that player uh, offer or not, but he might retire after his contract is up. And so for a team like Charlotte, are you really willing – to give up multiple picks that because of the, the talent situation that you currently have could mean that those picks are super valuable. Whereas another actual NBA title contending team like a Philadelphia or a Boston or whoever, when they're giving up picks, they're essentially giving up potentially the 24th or 25th pick in, in some future draft. Now, if the Hornets could give up a first rounder, say in like, 2027, 2028, some of these types of picks that went out in that Damian Lillard trade, then I would say, okay, well, I'm, I'm more open to that because then as an organization, Charlotte, you're essentially opening a window and saying, all right, we're, we have a plan to contend by 2027, 2028, so that those picks don't end up being one, two, three, or four. Uh, but if they're giving up next season's pick or the season after that, th then I do start to get concerned, hey, it, it, getting Drew Holiday is not a guarantee of success for this organization. It's not a guarantee of playoffs. It's not a guarantee of anything. So you can't, I think it would be foolish to give up a first round pick or multiple picks for, you know, in, in recent uh, drafts. 
Doug, do you like Ocean's Eleven? You like that movie, the first one? I do. We need one more. Yeah, yeah. We we, we always need. We know Ocean Seventeen at this point. That's what we need. There's a scene in which they are going through with the heist in Las Vegas, and one of the people that they got for the job, played by Don Cheadle, he's the bomb specialist, the electric electricity specialist, whatever. There's a scene where he's looking over the city, getting ready to detonate something that will turn off the entire power of the city for about 30 seconds, 45 seconds worth of time. And that was critical for them to be able to pull off this heist. When he pulls the trigger, he holds his crotch, looks away, squints, <laughs> and presses the button. Right. And I feel like Don Cheadle wanting to press the button, protecting myself, squinting, trading for Drew Holiday. Because you're right. He is the perfect player for us. He's perfect. Oh God, Drew, you beautiful backcourt. I love Drew. Pairing you, you beautiful backcourt soulmate to Lamelo Ball. Yeah, it. He's perfect for us, right? Because he's thirty three years old. We've been desperate for leadership. He is a bulldog, point of attack, not going to be moved easily. You know, guy that can defend anybody that you want handling the basketball like that. At, at least in the backcourt. Drew Holiday is that good. Offensively, I thought before I checked his stats, I was like, well, yeah, sometimes a three-point shot, it comes and goes. But the last three years, he hasn't shot anything below 38% on decent volume. You know how much I love playmaking, the secondary playmaking alongside LaMelo. It would be perfect for all the people that didn't want Scoot because they thought he was a primary ball handler. They didn't want to take the ball away from LaMelo. Drew ain't going to do that. Like even Giannis was running point as the point forward and Drew is totally cool being that secondary playmaker. If he opts out of that contract, which he's due to make $39 million, not this season, but the season after, then you got cap space and you don't have to pay a 34 year old. If he opts into it. Okay. You have somebody that at least you can squeeze the last bit of talent of somebody that fits perfectly alongside LaMelo. The problem is you have to give up picks they don't have their 2024 first round pick. Kai Jones, he's back, Doug. They the, the reason they don't have their 2024 first <laughs> is because that currently belongs to San Antonio. After that has been traded a couple of times, it originally was given up to New York when Charlotte wanted to go back in to the first round to select Kai Jones. And it has a lot of protection. A lot of people loved it, but that means that you can't trade it and you can't trade it for year after year after year because it probably won't convey. Mm -hmm. Whoo, buddy. I know that it would take a lot. Gordon Hayward, the salaries, we we do that in a heartbeat. We, we'd right. get rid of Gordon Hayward in a heartbeat. That's not a problem. Well, you, have, you have to because yep. um, I was reading Bobby Marks and, and apparently Drew, for a, for a period of time, uh, cannot be traded alongside other Blazers contracts. So you can't. You can't even acquire maybe another younger Blazers player as part of a larger package. It's got to be Drew for someone that makes the salary work or or multiple players that make the salary work for the other team plus picks. Yeah, so it would be some it'd be Gordon Hayward, you'd have about 5 million left to go and then so you would trade I don't know, uh, whatever, right? Whatever the Blazers wanted almost, except for Brandon Miller and Mark Williams, and you're right. clearly not trading LaMelo. So, yeah, man, I, I get it. If you don't want to get rid of multiple first-round picks, which is what it probably would take for Charlotte to get them, you know, I'll understand. But usually I'm a guy that's really cautious with getting rid of first-round picks. People think I would sit on my hands too much as a GM and do the Mitch Kupchak thing and not do a whole lot. Even for 33-year-old Drew Holiday, yeah, it, it it's I. We've been asking for that type of player too much for me to just say, eh, I don't want to get rid of a couple first rounders, especially with the whole let's give Lamelo a good team thing. There's a lot of reasons it makes sense to pursue this aggressively. If there were even one more guaranteed season on the contract, I would just I would totally be on board. I'd be like, let's go, let's let's you know, let's open the window, let's what, do this. What thing. if you what if you expect him to opt? Because like. The odds are you can't he bet would that. opt can, can in. Can you bet on that? Million. Can you really bet on that? I don't. Well, but but every this in the sense that every trade is a massive risk, right? Like then, I would I would make a pretty good bet that thirty four year old Drew Holiday would opt into a forty million dollar deal. Now, the, I guess there is the option that Drew Holiday would want to go play for an NBA Finals contender, opt out of it, and then you know get less money. That that's true. It's it's a risk. That's true. For holiday. Sure. I it is true holiday. 
<laughs> I see that risk, and I understand why the Hornets might want to take it. But it's tough, no doubt about it. It's tough. Um, and, but I don't expect it to happen. It would shock me if right. that happened because because I think there are so many factors working against it, and we just haven't seen Mitch Kupchak be able to pull off something like that. Um, it would be truly shocking if it happened. I And I don't think it would be anywhere near – uh, some of the greater trades that they've made in franchise history where they were able to open a window and, and start contending and, and trade assets. I don't, I don't think it would equal that. I think there would be a lot of risk involved, but it would, it would certainly be fun. I have some other takes on this trade that are semi-Hornets related uh, if you want to get to them on the other side. Let's do it. I do want to. That's true holiday as well. Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. Doug has more Dame trade takes. We'll get to those in just a moment. Not before we talk about DoorDash. This episode is brought to you by DoorDash. You've trusted DoorDash to deliver your restaurant favorites, and now you can get your grocery delivery that actually delivers too. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with each and every order. You'll get exactly what you ordered or they'll make it right. So sit back and enjoy quality groceries just like you pick them yourself. And if you want even more value, you can save on all of your grocery and restaurant favorites with a $0 delivery fee on all on all eligible orders with a Dash Pass membership. Get 50% off your first DoorDash order up to $20 value when you use code lock. Locked on NBA at checkout. Limited time offer. Term supply. That's 50% off up to $20. No minimum subtotal and zero delivery fees on your first order. When you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter code Locked on NBA. Don't forget that's code Locked on NBA for 50% off your first order with DoorDash. More Locked on Hornets coming up next. All right, Doug, you said you had more Dame trade takes. Why don't you lead us off with just one of them? Maybe around another player. Just what is one of the other takes that you have? No, it's not a player, it's a team, and that team is, well, really both of these are around teams. The first one is around Milwaukee, and Milwaukee is providing the Hornets with a blueprint that if LaMelo Ball goes all NBA, if he if he becomes one of the elite players in this league, top five, top ten, where, wherever you see him landing, the Bucks are providing, really everyone, but the Hornets in particular, a blueprint for how to take care of your superstar player, how to do whatever it takes um, and be savvy and find ways to keep that player happy, especially as the time ticks down and you get to that really decision moment for a superstar. Are they going to stay? Are they going to go? You're a small market and you've got a player who has shown some loyalty. How do you show that in return? The Hornets are nowhere near that situation right now, but fingers crossed, sicko hope, they are going to get to that position, and I hope they look back on what Milwaukee has been able to do, both what they gave up to acquire Drew Holiday and then giving up Drew Holiday to then go and acquire Damian Lillard to make sure that Giannis understands, hey, we are doing everything possible to make this happen. Sometimes we're even doing the impossible, which is we took Damian Lillard away from where he wanted to go, the Miami Heat. Yeah. No, this is the thing about Milwaukee. They A few years back, there was this debacle and this debate between keeping Eric Bledsoe or keeping Malcolm Brogdon. They pay Eric Bledsoe. They decide not to pay Malcolm Brogdon because they were about to dip into the luxury tax. For Milwaukee, that was reprehensible because when you talk about huh, a Giannis-led team with a squad that was looking to make that jump all the way into NBA Finals contention and you didn't want to get into – the luxury tax, because you, because even having Malcolm Brogdon and Eric Bledsoe, who were viewed as good player, Malcolm Brogdon still a good player. That was awful. Kudos to Milwaukee for not doing that anymore. Now they're a second apron team, I believe. After listening to Bobby Marks, I don't understand it as much as Bobby. That is not my info. But Bobby Marks said they're second apron team. This is their fourth year in the luxury tax. They made the move to go and get Drew Holiday, even if uh, Miritich didn't stay on that squad for a while. They went out and got Miritich. They go and get P.J. Tucker on that finals run. Yeah, they've made a bunch of moves. And so the question is, when is it the right time for the Charlotte Hornets to do that? Do well, you do it early? I mean, you have a you don't you're not even going to hit that big contract yet. It's not here for LaMelo. It'll be next season when that extension kicks in. Mm -hmm. 
But we all know that young stars can demand their way out of a franchise. He, he might want to choose where he goes, whatever, but he could demand out of the Charlotte Hornets franchise if he wants to, if they're not winning enough. And that's why, it, is, is it the time now yeah. to try to put a winning roster around him? I mean, we, we've been asking for it for so long. And if you look at somebody that fits this well into the puzzle, then it makes sense. To, like, look, I'm not going to be mad if the asking price was two first round picks. They trade their 2025, 2026 first. Remember, as I said in the last segment, they don't have their 2024. So that's three first round picks you don't control. Like, I get it. I get it'll not be going at least, after It'll Drew. be at least two first round picks. That's to me, that's like the basement of an offer. Yeah, you know what really sucks here is that you can't trade Miles Bridges on the qualifying offer. That would be interesting if Portland would go after some front court depth because they have the back court set. They have DeAndre Ayton. They don't have the small forward that Miles Bridges could be, but you can't trade them on this qualifying offer. Mm -hmm. So it, the avenues get a little bit more tough, right? Like Gordon Hayward, expiring salary, valuable at that point and helps be a grown up for the young players in Portland. You know, that, you know, at least, right? We, that's the idea here. Yeah, it's it's tough to make happen, but yeah, I I don't want to be out three first round picks, which would happen if you traded two. But yep. if it meant okay. getting Drew Holiday, yeah, like yep. I would, I'd love it. You know, I'd, it'd be fun. But so. they but they have to decide when to open that window and when to make the big move. Yep. And, and I'm not sure now is the time. Uh, but we'll see. I wouldn't fault them if they may, if they took that risk. Uh, but it would be an enormous risk that you're taking. Okay, so that's my Milwaukee take. Then I have mm -hmm. a Miami take. And that Miami take really boils down. It's a little complicated. It's a little complex. So hang with me, okay? My Miami take on all of this is, ha ha. <laughs> your Milwaukee take, or are you saying no? My Miami, Miami take. I'm, my gosh, my yes. Miami take is simply, ha ha. I'm just yes, basking in the division rival tears. I'm I'm feasting on these tears. I have an alert set up on Twitter every time a Miami Heat fan cries. Um, I have to go and just really enjoy huh. it. Um, because, you know, they tried to fly to the sun and they only had Tyler Hero and it wasn't enough. And and finally Portland said, just out of spite, just out of pure spite, said, all right, we're, we're sending him to Milwaukee. <laughs> and so, so you're getting your Nelson from the Simpsons laugh on is what you're That's doing. Great. Yes, That's it, it is. <laughs> so, yeah, took Miami. that because this is this is all karmic. Uh, this is all karmic, uh, you know, justice for taking the right twin, Caleb Martin. That's what all of this is. Yeah, and they didn't want to get rid of, I guess Portland didn't even want Tyler Hero, so you wonder if, you know, now Miami is just going to, it, it does affect the Hornets that way too. Here we are talking about the rumors that they'd be interested in Tyler Hero, and now he's not going to Portland. Now Miami won't even trade him. I mean, I know they're going to be interested in Drew Holiday as well, so if they're interested there, is Tyler Hero the guy? Like if Portland didn't want him for Dame, uh, they're not going to want him for, you know, Drew, right? I don't no. think. No. You know, the values change a little bit with Dame and Drew, but the Tyler Hero thing, maybe it's not over. Maybe the Hornets still could go after him. Maybe that still is something they could do. Um, okay, did you want to get to Brandon Miller in the third segment, or did you want to dive into the small forward position preview right now? Which one did you want to do? You're the producer. Uh, well, I want to talk about Brandon Miller because we did get an update yeah. from Coach Clifford during the luncheon, and it's a really simple update, but but I like it. And that's, uh, we'll, we'll read Steve Reed's tweet here at Steve Reed AP on Twitter. Uh, Steve Clifford praised number two pick Brandon Miller for being a quick learner, said he is a throwback player, said he gets the ball, moves, and cuts, loves his Sweet. positional size. What do you think about that, Walker? Yeah, positional size. I don't know why I I'm talking like this, but this tweet just made me talk like this. No one knows, but it's provocative. The <laughs> positional size thing is if Brandon Miller plays in the backcourt because 6'8 is about right for a small forward, but you also don't know if they just mean it's the most valuable archetype player in the NBA to have somebody that no, tall. No, hold on. It's a weird comment because everything yeah. we've heard is he's he doesn't have the size right now. Well, he, he doesn't have you know, the, the because girth. of the mono, the because strength. of coming in underweight like this. So it's it, it's an odd comment. Well, I guess you got to think he means height because it can't be the strength or the weight that he doesn't have that. And he's just a skinny guy. That's how it is. But also he's really tall and can handle the basketball a little bit and is a good playmaker. We know these are all the reasons why he drafted him on top of his shooting. Steve Clifford, I have to imagine it was a real nice compliment for him to say he's a throwback player because Steve Clifford, he's the kind of guy I think that likes the old school type play. Throwback coach. 
is a throwback coach. For yeah, well, sure. the, the Hornets threw him back and then and then caught him again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also in that update, I think, from Steve Reed about the Steve Clifford luncheon, just saying he is a quick learner, you know, works hard, which is the second time we've heard that. You know, even if you're cynical and think all the players say that about every young rookie that comes into the league, all the coaches say Steve Clifford, yeah, they, he said it's a, a quick, he's a quick learner. So that's nice. Uh, and I'm not, I don't doubt that. We saw that in summer league. Uh, Brandon was the smartest basketball player on that Hornet summer league roster. Yeah. I'm not cynical, but I am observational and I will observe that he had similar praises pre-training camp last season for Mark Williams. He said the exact same things. He said, love, love how quick he learns, love his basketball IQ. I think that to me, this is Steve Clifford's MO. Before you hit training camp, he's going to give you a little kudos. He studied your game a little bit, and he's going to tell you what he likes about your game. Build you up a little bit. But then when you get to training camp and you start going against the rest of the team, I think that's where the criticism start to get leveled and and the realism from Coach Clifford starts to hit. I mean, I just think that this is how he he sort of operates with young players. He's not going and I think it's a good way because I don't think it's great to like immediately come in and tear somebody down to say, well, you know, this rookie, he's gonna oh, yeah. have to he's gonna have to really earn his time. Like that's the first thing you hear in the media. If you're a player, if that's the first thing you heard, like, oh, this coach is like already on me, I think that would be discouraging. So I like that he comes out early with the praise, build it up. And then, hey, let's take a real look at your game. Once you start to put the ball on the floor against these guys, these veterans who have been in the league six, seven, eight years, okay, now we're going to really find out what's what. And that's what happened with Mark. You know, he was very honest in his evaluation of Mark Williams. Now, I don't think it's going to be the same situation where Brandon Miller ends up in Greensboro. No, no, no. I don't think that's (laughs) going to happen. But I think you're going to hear some more. I don't think these positive comments are going to make their way all the way through training camp. I think you're going to get real very quickly with uh, Clifford and and Miller. I was going to ask, yes, you made the observation that it's a lot like Mark. Does that mean we don't see Brandon Miller until after Christmas? (laughs) If he does that, if he does that, they may throw him up. They may throw him back a second time. (laughs) New ownership with their number two overall pick. Nah, he's in Greensboro. If you guys want to go check him out there, but he's not not playing on the big league squad. Yeah. After, especially after starting Dwayne Bacon in his first ever game, you decide to hold Brandon Miller in Greensboro. That would be fantastic. Uh, it, as a joke, it's a joke, people. It's a joke. <laughs> oh, I'll do, oh, put it on. I'm going to put it on the YouTube comments. Quote: Walker says, "If Steve Clifford yep. puts Brandon Miller in Greensboro, that would be fantastic." <laughs> yep, my mentions won't be filled up at all. Nope, that'll be fantastic. <laughs> that will too. All right, let's move on. Let's go to the next segment coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We'll continue through the small forward position preview. Just talked a little bit about one guy that'll be playing small forward. What about the other players on this roster? Gordon Hayward, the veterans, guys that could step up. That's coming up next on Locked on Hornets. Doug, let's continue our position preview series. We did the point guard position earlier this week. Also went through shooting guard. Now let's get to the small forward. Small forward, they got rid of Kelly Oubre. They don't have him any longer. Was kind of that backcourt two, three kind of guy off the bench, just depending on whatever role you needed him to play. But they gain a Brandon Miller, as we discussed in the last segment. So the guys they have on the roster that might fit that mold, Gordon Hayward, Miles Bridges coming back. Yeah, Miles Bridges coming back could play that role. Brandon Miller, as we mentioned. So there's three. They didn't really draft anybody that that would fit that guy outside of Brandon. You know, Nick Smith Jr. It would be more of a backcourt. Amari Bailey backcourt. Najee ain't even here. But if he was, he'd play center. So what do you make of the small forward position right now? What's your big question? My big question is there, like the shooting guard position, a lot of question marks at this position. Gordon Hayward, can you can you stay healthy? Can the points per shot attempt go up? Like efficiency wise, like he's become a worse offensive player uh, every single season that he's played for the Charlotte Hornets, available or not. You know, he just hasn't, he's become less and less reliable as an offensive weapon. And, and if you lose that, then I think you lose a lot of the things that you would use to justify his role within the offense. So, do, you know, when, when do the Hornets, I guess this will be my big question. When do the Hornets, make the decision to move on from Gordon Hayward at the three, whether that be via trade or via realization that, Hey, Hayward and Charlotte, there's not a future there. 
So when, when do we start to highlight some of the other tools that we have, whether that be Brandon Miller or slotting Miles at the three and allowing P.J. to get some starting minutes at the four? Because you you said Miles Bridges, I said maybe, because I, yeah. I feel like if they put their – if Miles Bridges is the Miles Bridges from two seasons ago talent-wise – then I think they end up slotting him at the four position. He's always played better as a four than a three. And then that allows you to get a little punch from PJ off the bench. So, yeah, I, I just, I think that's my big question. It really is Gordon Hayward. What's his future like as a starting three? When do they, when do they decide to finally move on? Yeah. How much flexibility are they going to roll with at the three spot is my, is my question. So, you know, how, how many combinations do we see there? Because remember, you also had Jalen McDaniels that would play that spot last year. He gets traded. Kelly Oubre, he's no longer here. Brandon Miller, he's coming about. Miles Bridges. So there's a lot of change at that position specifically, even though with the Miles Bridges thing, the change is you know, not as not as dramatic as it might seem with bringing a new player on board. The Miles Bridges stuff too. I've always liked getting him in space more so than just saying he's a straight up four. You know, I, I think for me, if if you look at what he did, even the last couple of seasons, or you know, not last year obviously, but two years ago when he was doing the whole fringe All Star thing, you know, he did play ninety two percent of his position there at power forward. Um, or excuse me, he played 69% um, nice. there, but he played 21% in that last year that he was a fringe all-star. So I, I think they actually explored a lot more with him at small forward in his breakout season than they did when he was just strictly viewed as a power forward. And if you get him out in space, you work with him in LaMelo, you can throw the lobs, you get him out in, in transition a little bit more. I think that would be interesting, especially to pair PJ alongside him. You still have a lot. You're not sacrificing spacing because Miles can shoot well enough to where you have spacing there. PJ is going to provide spacing as well. So maybe it doesn't even matter a ton. But th yeah, I think there's a lot of different combinations that you can roll with. And we've talked about some of the lineups that you might want to roll with. So could you <laughs> LaMelo, Brandon, Miles, PJ, Mark, that is a monster lineup. You're talking about mm -hmm. nobody below six seven allowed. I guess Miles Bridges is your power forward. He's kind of six six listed there, six seven, something like that. But nobody is short. And so that would be interesting where PJ wouldn't play the three over Miles. I just want to know how crazy Steve Clifford gets, Doug. And and it, I think it starts with who you have playing at that position. Uh, traditionally, he has he hasn't been all that crazy, or at least he's not mixy matchy. It, it seems like, you know, no you know, having observed yeah. Steve Clifford, oh, these many years, you get through training camp, you get through the preseason, and Clifford kind of locks in on a particular rotation on playing groups that he likes. He's going to stick with that for a period of time and only make changes if injuries force him to. And then if injuries force him to and those changes turn out to be positive changes, he tends to stick with that. So I'm not sure how crazy he's going to get. But this is an interesting situation for Steve Clifford in that he was brought in last season very late into the process, and there was already going to be a challenge for him to get caught up on this team, develop relationships, figure out what those playing groups are going to be. He already had that challenge. And then everybody got hurt. And so he never really got, a, I think, a, a firm grasp on what this team is, which is like step one, and then figuring out what this team can be. So I don't think he figured out either of those things. And now he comes into his second season. He's got a little bit of experience with some of these players. But now you're bringing in a number two overall pick that you've got to find time for. And you've got Miles Bridges. Where, where does where does he slot in and, and how does he slot in? Like mm. it's, It just seems like Steve Clifford for a second straight season is going to be a first-year head coach for the Charlotte Hornets because he's got to figure all this stuff out. Well, and last year he was he was required to be creative because of all the injuries. And so you try James Book because you were going to give James Book Knight a real fair shot at the beginning of last season. It doesn't work out. So now you're talking about taking his minutes away. Bryce McGowan's goes in there. Mark Williams ends up playing after Christmas. Before that, it was Nick Richards. Kai Jones saw some time. So Steve Clifford, he played everybody out of necessity because of injuries. We had the fun tail Maladon minutes at the beginning of the season. They went away real quickly, and then they happened again at the end of the season. So we know that he had to do that stuff. The other thing is you're going to be required to do something where you don't have your, your full resources at hand in the first 10 games of the season. So do you start somebody 
at small forward because it can't be Miles Bridges. And then when Miles comes back, does he come back to a situation where they've been playing pretty damn good ball with whoever is there at small forward? And so now does that throw a wrench in the preseason plans because the first 10 games, you know, who knows, right? Five and five would be good for this team, whatever. It actually, the schedule actually starts out pretty easy for them, but you get the idea. If it's different than you expected at the beginning of the season, then does Steve Clifford have to call an audible when Miles Bridges does come back? And if we think he's going to have rust and we don't think Clifford is just going to throw him into the fire immediately, are we talking about 15 games before Miles Bridges is playing 30 minutes a game again? Yeah, all that stuff is is real interesting to see how it's going to play out. Here's what's great about the small forward position, though, is that when you look at the, the four players that we have listed here, Gordon Hayward, Miles Bridges, Brandon Miller, Bryce McGowan's. You may even throw some Thor in there at three. I mean, I, I think he's probably going to find some minutes at backup four. But, you know, I think you could even throw Thor into this list of players. You've got Gordon Hayward, who's really playing for his next and most likely final contract. There's motivation there. For Miles Bridges, he's, he's playing to, you know, reclaim uh, the, the contract that he lost due to the felony domestic violence charges. So there's going to be motivation there to play well. Brandon Miller, uh, you know, I, I don't, he's motivated. I mean, he's a rookie, he wants minutes. And, you know, I think he wants to prove that, yes, I, I am the rightful second overall pick. Forget Scoot. I, I hope that motivation exists. I hope he, he wants to be great in that way. Wants to prove that, you know, all of those, all that stuff that happened at Alabama, that's in the past. There's, there's motivation to play well. And then the, the depth pieces, Bryce McGowan's and JT Thor, if you even have to rely on those players because of injury, you've got two players in Bryce McGowan's and JT Thor that Clifford trusts, that played good minutes last season, that did good things. And he likes so, JT. You, yeah, and even if they don't play, they're going to develop, and then those can be depth pieces if Miles Bridges goes away. The small forward position, despite being ranked 19th by the Athletic, by Law Murray, it's so worse than we've, we've already ranked the point guard and shooting guard position. Law had them at 15 both you got the small forward position at 19th probably because there's just no star power there's a lot of star power in small forward in the nba and so you know having gordon hayward as your starter is going to put you further down the list but i think this is one of the depthier positions for the charlotte hornets if you look two three years down the line well especially if you're talking about just secondary positions for people because it, it small forward you lose guys and it doesn't become a disaster you lose mm -hmm. your point guard it becomes a disaster right now lose your starting shooting guard and Terry Rozier big time disaster potential but yeah. if you lose a small forward in Gordon Hayward who gets injured because that's what's happened every up. single year when it when it happens Brandon Miller you know Miles Bridges could play that so that yeah it's it's not nearly as much of a disaster last point you brought up the Law Murray rankings you know it's going to happen right every single position Law Murray is going to rank the Hornets with a 15th ranking and then they're going to put them at 29 in the power rankings. <laughs> this, <laughs> right. Every every single position group is going to finish 14. Oh, that's probably 15. I think that's more of a 15 too. Hey, let's make it three 15s. Oh, that's a little bit worse. We'll make that a 16. Power rankings. Where's this team going to finish? Oh, they're 30th. They're 30 out of 30. But that. But honestly, you're, you're making a joke there. But honestly, that makes kind of that that makes a little sense to me when you think about the way the NBA is structured, which is that really star power when you have that superstar player it can mm -hmm. lift your average players make them so much better and and make you better as a team the, the hornets suffer from really not having healthy star power lamello has the potential to be that if he can stay healthy but you look at a team like oklahoma city and they've got positions that are probably ranked towards the bottom but then you have shea gilgis alexander as your number three overall point guard uh, in in Law Murray's rankings, it's going to lift all boats. The Hornets are average across the board, and when you're average across the board, it's like the saying in the NFL: when you've got three quarterbacks, you've got none, or you've got two quarterbacks, you got none. When you have all average players, you don't have any star power. And if you don't have any star power in the NBA, you're going to have a very tough time winning basketball games consistently. And that's been the Hornets' problem for many many years. There is this other question that I have in the rundown, but I don't. I want to tease it for tomorrow's show because I think it's an important question. I think it's worthy of a first segment. I think it's worthy of a, a longer discussion that we don't have time for right now. And the question is this. So here's the tease. We, talk, we talked a little bit about Brandon Miller in this segment. What can Brandon Miller do specifically to get a bigger role in this small forward rotation as quickly as mm. possible? Not, 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 you know, all-star break. 
How can he get into this small forward rotation in a serious way, in a starting way, as quickly as possible? I think we answer that question next show. Great tease delivery. And with that, <clears throat> we'll end it, including a clearing of the throat. Thanks for making us your first and... listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcast. That includes YouTube. Go check out Doug on his Substack, stack, everyhornetsboxscore.com. Listen to me every weekday from 12 to 3 p.m. on Sports Radio 92.7 WFNZ. Make every moment, every top performance, every result a part of your life by listening to Game to Game NBA, making it your second listen right after you check us out, especially during the season. Again, anywhere you get your podcast. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow.